be seated. Please open your copy of God's Word to 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Our text on this Commitment Sunday, in which we've challenged ourselves to go the second mile, to do more than is required, to do the hard thing by trying to finish the job that we started, and to do something extraordinary, and that's to retire our debt uh, in two years. The text I've chosen to use is one that I've ignored, honestly, although it's one of my favorites, I've ignored it for probably the past 15 years. When I first encountered it, this was kind of an obscure text, an Old Testament story with a relatively unknown character hidden between a bunch of bagats. Of course, that all changed in the year 2000 when a guy named Bruce Wilkinson, he wrote a book that was called The Prayer uh, of Jabez, and it sold 10 million copies. So I've been a little embarrassed to speak about it because it, it's, it's so familiar, but more than that because cause really the, the text has been misused and, and misunderstood because there are some who have read the book and they understand the prayer of Jabez as a formula for success, that if you will just repeat this prayer over and over again, that great things will begin to happen in your life. Jabez prayed this, Oh, that you would bless me, enlarge my territory, be with me, and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And listen to the author of the prayer of Jabez's book, Bruce Wilkinson, he writes, I want to teach you how to pray a daring prayer that God always answers. It is brief, only one sentence with four parts, but I believe it contains the key to a life of extraordinary favor with God. Make the Jabez prayer for blessing part of the daily fabric of your life. And to do that, I encourage you, he says, to follow unwaveringly the plan outlined here for the next 30 days. And by the end of that time, you will begin to notice significant changes in your life. Read the prayer of Jabez every morning. Reread this little book once a week. The problem is that the scripture never speaks of the prayer of Jabez as a model that we're to follow or to repeat which is the key then to a life of wealth and being free from harm and pain and extraordinary favor with God. In fact, the prayer of Jabez really is not a particularly good prayer, not in and of itself, at least not in terms of it being a model that we're to follow. Now, I know that because when the disciples, you remember, they asked Jesus to teach them, Lord, how are we to pray? And, and the Lord said, this is how you're to pray. You're to say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us of our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then he goes on in, in the Luke version to say, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The model prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, it's not self-centered, but it's God-centered. And when we model our lives and our prayers after Jesus and we teach others to pray like Jesus, the result is not self-regard. It doesn't make us more self-focused and self-centered, but our regard becomes for the kingdom of God and for others. And our prayer is that, that as the will of God is done in heaven, that might be true in heaven for all those around us. And if we pray the prayer of Jabez, as a model prayer which promises that it will make us wealthy and which will rescue us from pain and harm as the book promises. And if, if we teach others that that's the way you should pray with the same expectation, um, then when people don't become wealthy and when people do experience pain and harm, as I just got word that Paul Powell, who preached for us last Sunday, that his son died, who's 57 years old, last night, 
When you teach the prayer of Jabez that way, with that expectation, it causes people to question God's faithfulness while we live in the midst of a, a world that's marred by sin. That the scripture says there are two kingdoms at war right now. I don't know if you've experienced it or not. If you've lived very long, Jesus said that there's the kingdom of God that's at war with the kingdom of this world and they are in violent opposition to one another in this world. And disappointment with God. I mean, so many, I meet people all the time. They're just disappointed with God, and the reason they are is because of bad theology. They promise things on God's behalf that God never promised himself, at least not in this life. And if people pray the prayer of Jabez as a formula for success, and they do happen to get rich, and at least for a while they are free from pain, which is totally possible in the world we live in and Christianity in America, that's very possible. Even then, it's possible if you pray that prayer to become self-centered religious people that are disinterested in the things of the kingdom of God and the ways of God's will. And it reminds me of that old saying. You remember the old saying that the problem with the rat race is that even when you win, you're still a rat, right? So although I love the story of Jabez, I mean, I, I, I love this story of Jabez. It's one of my favorite. When the book came out, I just kind of ignored the story of the past 15 years or so because the book was so popular and it's on everybody's coffee table and and I didn't want to rain on everybody's parade because that's not any fun and inevitably what's going to happen to me today at the end of this service somebody's going to come up to me and they're going to say that book encouraged me to pray and if it can encourage you to pray that's a good thing like I'm for that or somebody's going to say, I prayed that prayer, and it worked for me. And, and I'm going to say, well, man, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad that it worked for you. And I know that God can hit straight licks with crooked sticks. So I just kind of found it easier just to ignore it. But this week, as I was trying to pray about it and think about, what do I talk to you about on this Commitment Sunday? I think a crucial day in the life of our church. And, and that's been my big struggle the past month is how do we really convey our, how significant I really think what we're trying to do is to the future in ways it's hard to even express. I was praying, what do I talk about in the text that kept coming back to my mind? Not the book, The Prayer of Jabez, but the story of Jabez in First Chronicles 4. Look at verse 9. Let's look at what the text actually says. It says that Jabez was more honorable than his brother's. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Jabez was clearly an underdog. It says that he was more honorable than his brothers, which is kind of an interesting way to describe somebody. If they were going to choose to describe him, isn't that odd? He was more honorable than his brothers, and we don't know exactly what that means. It doesn't necessarily mean that Jabez himself was so noble, but I think it does certainly suggest that Jabez came from a family environment that wasn't so great. He was, was more honorable. You remember that old story, I'm sure you do, about the two wealthy brothers that were just sorry and evil, and they made all kinds of money in this small town, but they did it in unkind ways. They, they did it in unscrupulous ways. And just like the brothers, one of the brothers died, and the other brother went to the most respected pastor in that town and said, I want you to do the funeral for my brother, although they never attended church anywhere, but said, I want you to do the funeral for my brother, and I'll pay you $50,000 on one condition, that you will say about my brother that he was a saint. Well, that was a problem because, I mean, he was certainly, I mean, he, this was a bad dude, and, and he had this moral dilemma, but he also knew how much the church could use that money. So eventually he decided to do the funeral service, and in the funeral service, he said about this brother who died, he said he was a sorry individual all his life. He never followed Christ. He was unkind in the way he made his money. He was unscrupulous in the way he did that. This was an evil man, but compared to his brother, he was a saint, right? <laughs> well, compared to his brother, his brothers, Jabez was more honorable than them. But the bar, truthfully, it may not have been set all that high. Verse 9 continues, his mother named him Jabez, saying, for I gave birth to him in pain. Now, why would a mother name a son that? Some suggest that the pregnancy and the labor was so difficult 
that as she gave birth to this child, Jabez, that she decided it was so painful physically that she decided to name him Jabez. The word Jabez in, in Hebrew sounds very much like the word pain in Hebrew. And it means for he was brought forth in pain. And so maybe the physical, the, the pain of childbirth caused her to name him that. And if that's the case, then that means that most of us, right, could have been named Jabez. Others point out that why the brother and, and, and the mother are mentioned, there's no mention of the father. And so some point to the idea that it may very well be this wasn't physical pain that caused her to name him Jabez, but maybe it was emotional pain of the father leaving while she was pregnant, and, and she just expressed that in, through the birth of her son. We, we don't know that. We just know the father was absent, and, and, and he's unmentioned. We don't know with certainty why his mother named him Jabez, but we know that she did, and it seems like a bad idea for a child to have, grow, have to grow up with a name like pain, doesn't it? I remember talking to Cliff and Jeannie Poe, you know, Matt, our student pastor. Uh, I talked to them years ago, and they were saying that they thought about naming Matt Al, but they didn't want him to have to grow up being called Al Poe, right? I mean, you got to think when you're naming your kid. You know, there was a dentist in Tyler whose name was Dr. Payne. No kidding. Now, that's not his parents' fault. They didn't know he was going to become a dentist, but I still didn't go to him. I don't want to go to a dentist named Dr. Payne. There's another doctor named Dr. Pullum. We have an incredibly talented psychiatrist in our town, a counselor, and no kidding, you know what his name is, is Dr. Looney, right? And he has somehow continued to be successful in, in spite of that. I grew up with a friend whose name was Adam Baum, and you know what they named, uh, not, his name was Jim, my friend, but they named him Adam Baum. Isn't that crazy? Another person, last name Bath, named their, son, their daughter Anita, Anita Bath. That's why Doug and Karen Lee didn't name their boy Brock, because nobody wants a broccoli for a son, do they? I didn't name my son Cobb either, and you can figure out why. You know, there's a former governor whose name was Hogg, right? You remember what he named his daughter? This is a true story. He really did name his daughter Ima. I'm a Hogg. I mean, come on. Think a little bit. Well, the mother named her son Jabez, for I brought him forth in pain, and maybe I'm being too hard on her. But I kind of question her judgment. I mean, I, I couldn't have been, uh, it couldn't have been good on this young man's ego, and his self-esteem to go through life being named pain. I mean, his brothers already, they were not honorable brothers, right? Less honorable than him. That means when his friends saw him on the playground, they said, there goes the little pain right there. So, you consider all of verse 9. Life doesn't appear to have been very easy for Jabez. Dishonorable brothers, at least less honorable than him. Absent father. Mother who chooses to name him Pain, we would understand, and we would understand well if, if he just turned out to be another statistic of a dysfunctional family, right? We would get it. But that's not what happens to Jabez. It, it's not what happens, and the question is why? Why did it turn out different for Jabez? It's because one day, this so-called little pain from a difficult, unfortunate family cried out in prayer to the God of Israel. Now, I've already told you, it wasn't a great prayer. The, the important thing, it's not important how he prayed or what he prayed. The important thing is that he prayed. And Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. Five times in one short little verse, Jabez says, me, my, me, me, I. Good grief. When you compare that to the Lord's Prayer, the model prayer, I mean, it's selfish, all right. No getting around that. But you know another way to accurately describe that prayer? It might just be desperate. You know, it might just be sincere, honest. And, and truthfully, if Jabez were able to be here and talk, maybe Jabez would be saying to us, look, man, I didn't know somebody was going to write a book about this and say it's to be a model prayer. I was just praying. I was just crying out for help. So there's nothing special about this guy. 
There's nothing special about the words he used in the prayer. In fact, I think the opposite's true. Jabez is a definite underdog with a painful life, little to offer, and a selfish prayer. And I'm tempted, I mean, I'm tempted to read the prayer, and I'm tempted to say, eh, thanks for playing, Jabez. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200, right? No, we're not going to answer your prayer. But hold on. Not so fast. Slow down. Because listen to how the scripture answers. It's the reason I love the story so much. It's the reason the story of Jabez is, is one of my favorites. Is because Jabez prayed this not so great prayer. And the scripture says simply, and God answered his request. What? Can you believe that? Well, yeah, I can. I sure can, down to the very, the very center of my being. I understand it. Jabez didn't deserve it. He didn't earn it. He didn't say the prayer the right way and the words just right, so God felt compelled to bless him. God blessed him because he loved him. God blessed him because he wanted to. He felt compassion for him. You know, people all the time, I hear them say, prayer works, and I know what they mean, but too often we, we view prayer as it, like God is in a bottle, and he's like a genie. If we rub him just the right way, then he pops out of the bottle, and he grants our three wishes. And, and that's not the way God is at all. Listen, we forget that it's not prayer that works. It's a loving God of grace that works on our behalf when in our helplessness we cry out to him and we ask him. And the thing about the story of Jabez that I think is so likable is that his story is so similar to your story and it's so similar to my story, at least if we're a Christian, it is. Every time I hear somebody share their testimony, and, you know, one of the great joys of, and it's weird to say it sometimes, like, that as we've been doing this campaign, you know, we did our own campaign. We didn't have a consultant this time. There's nothing wrong with having a consultant. But we did our campaign to retire the debt. We just did, our, did it ourselves, and we spent a lot more time sharing and telling our stories. And, you know, the thing that seems to be similar to the stories that people shared over and over again is that their story sounded like Jabez. I mean, all the time, people talking about a time in their life when they were desperate, time when they were in need, time when they didn't have much to offer God and they simply cried out for God's blessing. I heard people say over and over again, I don't know, I can't explain how God has been so gracious and God has been so good. Over and over again. Not that we deserved it, not the prayer life was great, but because God loves us. You know, it's the story of David, isn't it? I mean, I mean, they're coming to pronounce who the king is going to be, and David's the youngest son. They don't even bring him in. His father doesn't bring him in. It's obviously not David. I mean, David doesn't have anything to offer, but David's the one God chooses to be king. It's Moses' story, isn't it? I mean, when Moses was in, the, in Egypt, he was a part of the, the, the royalty there. I mean, he was a young guy. He was strong. I mean, he had everything going for him. God could really use him then, but he doesn't. You remember, he murders an Egyptian. He's cast out. When he's 80 years old, he's past his prime. God can't use him now, not as old as he is. That's when God chooses to use him to free the people from slavery. It's Paul's story, isn't it? Paul's the chief of sinners, he says. He persecuted the church. And somehow, in the midst of Paul being blinded, realizing he's been wrong, thinking God's about to snuff him out, he just cries out to God, and God uses him to become the greatest missionary who's ever lived, who wrote about half the books uh, of the New Testament. It's Ruth's story, right? Who's a Moabitess, who's not even welcome in the temple of God, and yet she becomes a part of the lineage of, of Jesus, right? Do we just keep on going on? How about Mary, this young teenage girl who doesn't, she's not worthy. She knows she's not worthy, and God knows she's not worthy. But God chooses to use her. 
It's, and, and you know, the thing is, what's awesome is it could be your story. If it's not already your story, it could be your story. If you would cry out to God for help, and the reality is that God promises that he'll save you. Why? Because he's our heavenly father. He loves us. He's waiting for you to give him a chance. In the Sermon on the Mount, there's just that really beautiful passage where Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? Your heavenly Father. You know, when Jesus was teaching us in the model prayer, and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. He said, pray like this. Pray to our Father in heaven. But Father's not the best translation. It's not intimate enough. The word there is Abba. What Jesus was telling us to pray, a better translation than Father is, is Daddy, but that's not in, in, intimate enough. The prayer that Jesus taught us to pray was, the best translation would be Dada. Dada. Do you remember when you held your daughter or your son in your arms and the first time they uttered the word Dada? Guys, remember that? And I always joke, but it's not a joke, it's really true that my girls said Dada before they said Mama, right? <laughs> they did. It's true. And, and the reason is because they love me more than their mom. <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> totally wrong. But I played it up, boy, it was awesome. But there's something, when your child says, you remember that age? And they say, Dada, it's harder to say Mama, but that's the reason. And, J and Jesus was saying, when you pray, it's not just our Father, it's, it's Papa, it's Abba, 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 Abba. If you think of a little Hebrew baby, the first words off their lips were Abba, 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 Abba. He's saying, pray like that because God is our heavenly father and he loves us you think about how you love your kids what do your kids have to do to be in right relationship with you all they've got to do is just want it right they just have to want to be they don't have to earn anything sometimes you hold them in their arms and they slap at you when they're little kids because they don't even know what they're doing you don't get mad and say you little impudent thing no you don't do that you just grab them and hug them because you love them they're your children, and all they have to do is just want to be in relationship with you, and they're there. If you then know you're evil, if you then know you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? It's why the scripture says and promises that God showed his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you left today from this place not knowing Jesus Christ, not knowing for certain that you belong to him, not knowing with absolute conviction that you were a Christian, that you'd be saved for all eternity, it is your deal and it's on you because it's not on God. Because God's saying, you, you respond to me, you accept me now. It, you ask me. I mean, there's something real important about asking. He's not going to force his way, but you ask me, and I'll save you. And if you're in trouble, if you'll ask me, I'll, I'll help you. You know, the problem with the prayer of Jabez book is not that it promises if we cry out to God that he'll bless us. That's true. And our sanctuary is just full of people who will be glad to tell you how they've experienced that and how true it is. The problem with the book is that it teaches us to focus all our hope of God's blessings on this world, which because of sin is a screwed up world that God promises one day to make right, not for a little while, but for all eternity, if we know him. And it teaches that the way to receive those blessings is by living a self-focused, life and repeating a self-centered prayer. The wonderful thing about the story of Jabez, and the reason it's one of my favorites, is it reminds us that Jabez cried out to the same God of grace that you and I can cry out to today. 
And if God answered his desperate request, his self-centered request, this is kind of what I, I spent a long time getting here, didn't I? But this is kind of what I was trying to get to in the sermon this morning for this occasion. I mean, if God will bless that desperate, self-centered request, how much more will he bless us to be able to fulfill what we're attempting unselfishly, that we're praying that God will help us do for his kingdom and for his church? So this morning, as we come to to do something that we don't often do. I mean, a lot of our prayers are like Jabez. God, help me and help my family and help me get this house and help me get this and help me get through this and help me do this. Today, as we come to bring an offering to the Lord for his church so that his kingdom might not just do okay, that his kingdom is, is, is worthy. If it's our church, it's worthy of being a place that's doing great that, that as we do this, we come asking God to bless what's, what's his will and, and knowing that I can say to you with confidence that, that as you do this, that some or all uh, of the blessing that he's going to give you because you've honored him and he's going to bless you, some or all of that blessing will happen in this life. Some or all. But all of it, God promises, that as we honor him, that he will bless us for all eternity. So I'm going to pray, and when I, when I finish, I invite you with the spirit of prayer, as we sing and some music is playing, I'm going to invite you to come forward, and, and just as they did in the Old Testament, as we've done it, it, it tremendous, importantly, important moments in our church, place your prayer or your commitment, your pledge card in this before God, and... Um, and going to pray that God will bless that. And you know what? You may be here and, and, um, and your offering to the Lord is not a, a pledge. It's your life. Maybe you're not a Christian. And, and uh, the truth is, like all of us, I'm certainly in that category. And anybody who's a Christian here is, has been in the place of Jabez simply with s- sincerity and, and honestly desperation, knowing they can't do anything about their sins, but needing to be in relationship with God and needing for Christ what he did on the cross to be relevant for their lives and applicable, maybe what you need to do is to come and say, I've given my life to Christ today and I want to share that with the congregation. Maybe you'd come and join this church. This is where God's called you to be involved. So I'll be off to the side, tap me on the shoulder. I'd love to share that decision with the church. But we'll pray and then don't all come exactly the same time, but but you move and uh, make these pledges before the Lord. Let's pray. Father,